Hello, welcome to the Horticulturalists. I am Matthew Lucas. And I am Stephen Ryan. You are indeed, and we do post every week on a Friday, so do hit subscribe if you want to watch our continuing horticultural adventures. And this week, yes, we're not even in Australia. Well, we are. Well, we are, yes. But I recently took a tour uh, to the South Island of New Zealand, yes. a garden and natural landscape tour. Yep. And so I've put some footage into Matthew's hot little hands and we're going to visit some fabulous gardens in New Zealand. How exciting. And I can tell you they are all amazing. And we're going to go through each one, one by one, and the key things that struck you and that might interest you. So just a bit of an overview. Who was the organisation that you were right. with? Uh, I work for a company called Australian Studying Abroad. Yep. So if you went into a search engine and put ASA Tours, it would come up. And you can then look at the tours from all around the world. Which also means if you want to go on tour with Stephen Ryan, yes. you can. <laughs> you definitely can. So we'll put the link to Australian Studying Abroad below. We'll also put the links below to any of the gardens that you visited that have a website and are yep. open to the public. And we'll also, as we always do, include a list of all the plants Stephen mentions in our copy below so check out the plant list if you're interested exactly because it, it can be pretty difficult to write those names down in a big hurry it can well i think without further ado Stephen, we should head off to the south island and see the first thing that caught your eye what a good idea i'd like to thank all of those garden owners who welcomed my group through their gardens on our south island of new zealand tour it was a fabulous trip and everybody enjoyed it wish i was there Stephen ryan well you could have been if you paid <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm curious to see what we're going to look at first. Well, we're going to look at one of New Zealand's iconic plants. Not that it's the only one, but there are lots of them. Yes. And it's a plant from the Marlborough region called the Marlborough Rock Daisy. Let's have a look. New Zealand Rock Daisy. Pacistegia insignis in full bud. Looking very handsome indeed. Stephen, now we have oft spoken about the use of coloured foliage. We've made videos about using copper coloured things yep. and lime coloured things and variegated things. And you've got quite specific ideas about how to use them. Yes, I so what is the garden we're going to first look at in the South Island of New Zealand? All right. Well, we're going to Flaxmere Garden, which is a beautiful English style landscape yep. with big vistas, sweeping lawns, wonderful water features and a really good collection of plant material. OK. And what we're seeing is, looking across the vista, you'll see a beautiful copper beach with a background of fabulous clematis in flower at the time we were there. Now, I love that. And you are also the king of multi-use. So there you've got a white flower and clematis through a bronze colored Yes, so you've tree. got the, Amazing. that sort of combination. And as you pan across, you will see as we get to the other side, the purple's picked up again so that it gives a sense of balance by a beautiful, large, symmetrical looking purple leaf smoke bush. So one of the cottonists. There you go. A beautiful use of copper plants in a broad landscape. Yep. But talking of which, is this not a New Zealand plant behind us? Well, it is, in fact. It's a purple-leafed form of Potosporum tenuifolium called Tom Thumb. It's not easy to get around the trade because it's surprisingly difficult to propagate. Mm. And this plant would be about two metres tall and about 30 years old. So quite slow growing. And this... Halaragus. It's another New Zealand plant, and New Zealand does bronze very, very well. This is <laughs> Halaragus erecta wellington bronze, which is a, a lovely, more or less herbaceous perennial from New Zealand with purple foliage. All right. Well, Stephen, we're on your pointless pier. <laughs> <laughs> over my less than pointless pond. Now, I said with love, we've yeah. made videos about water features before, and we've covered this pier, and it's actually not pointless because no, it, it does enables you to get into the pond anyway. Forgive right. me. But we are talking about architectural features because some of the gardens you saw had mm. really striking elements, and it reminds me of that garden we visited last year, Reverie, which we'll link below, which had amazing Corten sculptures. Yes. So what's the first thing we're looking at now? All right, well, we're going to look at some sculptures in a garden called uh, Honatihi, if I get my Maori pronunciation right, yep. at Littleton, which is quite close to Christchurch. Yeah. And it belonged to one of New Zealand's uh, leading architects. Ah. Uh, yes, Sir Miles Warren was the name of the gentleman. Mm -hmm. And he did a lot of brutalist type um, architecture around Christchurch and other parts of New Zealand. Mm. And he's left his garden to the people of New Zealand. And you can go and visit the garden. And it has a lot of sculptural elements in it. Well, I love that turbine-y Corten thing. It's amazing. Yeah, and he's got all sorts of things. There's stone sculptures, there's mm. classical 
sculptures, there's all sorts of weird and wonderful things around the garden. Mm. So maybe a little too many for my taste, but some really interesting pieces. There you go. But I think, again, it's that thing. It's your garden and it's your creativity. Yep. Do with it what you will. Exactly. Now, talking of pointless piers, <laughs> which we're not, you do have your theory about bridges, which can be pointless if you can see your way around. Yep. But this bridge is stunning. Now, where is this one? All right, this is in a garden called Hortensia. And it actually has the advantage of having a beautiful crystal clear stream mm. running through the middle of the <sighs> garden. So it's a natural stream mm. that runs right the way through the middle of the garden. Yeah. So the owner owns both sides yeah. and she's put in a fairly predictable but beautiful Monet bridge mm. in the classical Monet sort of colours. Mm. And it does tie in because the house is also painted in similar colours. It's got a similar shade of blue on the mm. roof of the house mm. and around the fascia boards, etc. And so the whole thing ties together quite nicely. Mm. So it's a very, very attractive feature in a garden. That looks like a magical garden as well. Oh, it is. Beautiful collection of plants. And of course, Hortensia is the French name for hydrangea. And she does have quite a remarkable collection of those as well. Uh -huh. Now the next architectural feature I just adore. What is this woven gateway to paradise we're seeing? <laughs> we're at the Riverstone Cafe, which has a productive garden. Yeah. And they've done something that you quite often see in England, but you don't see it terribly much in the Southern Hemisphere, and that's willow weaving. Yeah. And so the fences have all been made out of woven live willow. Mm. Some of it lives, some of it doesn't after it's been done because you just cut the canes, do the weaving, they're shoved in the ground, they take root. Then you've got to trim them back every year once they start to grow again so it's a really attractive and interesting and although you have to be rather artistic and clever it's a reasonably inexpensive way to in fact create a barrier or wall you also need willows well you do you need plenty of willows to get plenty of material from but that um, is beautiful it's and it's also so organic so rather than using metal or wood mm -hmm. it feels beautiful and yeah. natural well, Bevan Smith, the well-known, uh, at least in New Zealand, restaurateur who uh, runs the property, uh, it belongs to his parents, it is just mind-blowing. It is a really large garden. Mm. They grow most of the food they use, yeah. so everything is seasonal, yeah. and it was just the most fantastic place to be. And we also had a lovely lunch there, and he was the winner of the best restaurant in New Zealand in 2010. Well, I wouldn't know because I wasn't there, no. but let us now <laughs> move on to the next fabulous garden that you saw on your New Zealand trip. What a good idea. Stephen, we're beside your leaky pond, which is full. <laughs> yes, we had rain last night, but that's fine. Yes, we wanted to talk a wee bit about some water features I also saw in our New Zealand tour. Yes, now we've got a whole water feature playlist, which we'll link below, but these were quite beautiful, mm. different water features. Oh, now, yes. this first garden, now we looked at that stream before with the Monet Bridge, which was a natural stream. Yeah. Tell me about this garden, because this looks natural as well. Well, it isn't. It's in fact a designed garden, ah. and it's a designed water feature. Mm. Um, uh, and it was actually designed by a Japanese gardener to have that Japanese ah, aesthetic. And it does, now you yeah. say that, yes. Yeah. And so it's a garden called Moritake and it's in Blenheim, yep. uh, which is sort of in the north of the South Island for those who don't know their geography of New Zealand. It's not a particularly big garden. It's probably on about an acre, maybe a little more. And it is solely planted with New Zealand native plants. Mm. So it has a Japanese aesthetic, mm. but it has a New Zealand plant palette. Which is interesting, isn't it? Because just how you manage that, a very specific aesthetic using a different mm. type of vegetation. But what is that palm tree? Well, a New Zealand native palm, obviously. Ah. Yes, it's the Nikau palm, which is, well, it depends on what authority you go by, but yeah. it's supposedly the most southerly uh, palm in the world. Mm. Uh, but if you go to Chile, they say they have the most southern palm in the world. But anyhow, mm. uh, so the Nikau palm, uh, Raphastylus sapidum, it is a beautiful sort of shuttlecock shaped palm yeah. that grows throughout parts of New Zealand and also on the Chatham Islands. Now, obviously, I'm presuming they're quite young. Is it you know, like a palm tree, palm tree? Oh, yes. Tall trunk, yeah. da-da-da. Yeah. This garden is only probably about 15, 20 years old. Right. So the plant material is still comparatively young. Mm. Uh, so the palms have still got a long way to go and they can get very, very tall. And they are 
presumably very hardy then. They're pretty cold hardy. I mean, mm. they're not going to grow well in Ontario, but they will mm. grow in fairly cool climates. So are a palm that might just sneak through in, in warmer parts of England as, mm. as being seen as reasonably hardy. Certainly not the world's hardiest palm, but it's up there. Well, let's not go into those because we are going to do a hardy palm special, are we not, with a specialist we, grower? We will indeed in due course. But now let's go to another beautiful body of water. So now, what are we looking at this time? I love this pond. Is it a pond? Mm. Yes, it's a pond. Uh, it's a man-made one. It's yep. not a natural water feature. Mm. And it's actually in the Dunedin Botanic Gardens, mm -hmm. uh, which is New Zealand's oldest botanic gardens. Yeah. Only by a year or two, but nonetheless, <laughs> it's the oldest botanic gardens. But they win. And it also has a world-recognised landscape. So mm. not only has it got, I don't know, nearly 7,000 different species of plants growing mm. in it, including a rhododendron dell and goodness knows what else, but the landscape itself uh, is remarkable. It's on mm. a fairly steep site. And oh. you'll notice with this particular pond yeah. that it's got a really dense and attractive planting all the way around and behind it. And I love the layers, the, the form, the mm. colours, the shape. And there's nothing particularly in bloom, but it looks so engaging to yeah, the eye. Does. And of course, a pond backed by a good thicket of plant material yeah. means that the eye is kept towards the pond and you're not then being drawn out into the um, landscape further and again you've made this point with your pond up there in our pond video that mm. it's like the pointless bridge you've got to make sense that if you're on a slope and you can see yeah if the, the damn walls yes yeah. if the pond isn't contextualized or enclosed then it looks a bit odd and artificial mm. so if that's a steep slope surrounding it with quite high vegetation really grounds it and makes it look very natural yeah, it does it certainly does and you also pointed out with your ponds that when you plant right to the edge you then disguise perhaps if there is a lining of the yeah. pond yeah and that's one thing that you've got to try and do very carefully mm. unless it's an obviously artificial geometric shaped water feature then you really do have to set it into the landscape so that yeah. it looks like a natural pond well that is a winner yeah great one all right, on to the next. Stephen Ryan, Hypericum is in your garden, not a rhododendron to be seen. No. Do you despise rhododendrons? Do you no, have the same feelings about them as you have of roses? Oh, now we're going to offend everybody in the world. Uh, no, I don't. In fact, I love rhododendrons, mm. but because of the climate I'm in and the fact that my soil is hydrophobic, yeah. over the years I've lost every rhododendron I ever planted. So oh. I can grow them at the nursery, we can grow them up on the top of Mount Macedon perfectly well, yeah. but down in this drier, sclerophyll forest type environment, environment that we have down here mm. they don't do well unfortunately and in fact we made a video a few weeks ago about a fantastic garden called Durrell yeah. and that still had amazing rhododendrons in bloom oh, yeah. which is literally five minutes up the it's, road it's amazing how the climate varies however, however in New Zealand oh yes they grow some fantastic rhododendrons there and probably the best collection is at the Dunedin Botanic Gardens where we saw these ones now this one that we're looking at here the Marquis of Lothian how old is that looks incredible yeah well it is it's a very old rhododendron it dates right back to the late 1800s yeah it's a new zealand selection apparently mm. what the connection between the marquis of lothian and new zealand is and I that have, rhododendron and that rhododendron i have no idea but it was definitely bred in new zealand and named after the marquis so mm. i don't know maybe there was some maybe he distant was a, relationship or a there. passionate rhododendron grower well it could be that as well mm. so the new zealand rhododendron dell at the botanic gardens in dunedin Mm. has a huge collection of rhododendrons mm. and it is trying to source all of the New Zealand cultivars that it can possibly get because there were some very good rhododendron breeders in New Zealand particularly early part of the last century. So I was going to say we were joking about roses but there are a lot of rose breeders in the southern hemisphere doing amazing things rhododendrons as well and i guess maybe that was because of the climate it was just mm -hmm. perfect for growing rhododendrons it, it is in fact and if you happen to be in dunedin any time during the spring mm. uh, i would definitely recommend a wander through the rhododendron dell it is quite something well we have in our minds in our schedule to visit the the rhododendron botanic garden here in victoria yes. which is in the dandenong mm. mountains um not for, well actually quite a way away from here but anyway so we will visit that at some point because they have an amazing collection they of they certainly do but you do grow Varea rhododendrons and we made a video about that which is the epiphytic sort of subtropical one yes which are quite a different sort of kettle of fish really in the rhododendron genus yeah yeah, yeah but amazing plants nonetheless well they were beautiful let's go on to the next all right
Stephen, we're back in our Pin Oak Avenue, which we covered in our Unusual Avenue video. We certainly are, and it's a slightly tenuous link to a beautiful laburnum arch that I saw on a New Zealand trip oh. in the wonderful garden of Larnack Castle at Dunedin. Now, I don't know why, but I just love laburnums. I know they're very toxic, aren't they? They are toxic. The seeds are quite toxic. So mm. if you've got some people who arrive for dinner unexpected, <laughs> you'll know what to do. Oh, Stephen, um, you've been watching too many bad movies. So what is special about this other well, than it's fabulous? The thing about laburnum is that it only has about a two to three week flowering period. Ah. So it can be very spectacular for that very short time. And then? But then it can be really boring. But this particular um, arch has mm. been planted in such a way mm. that the plants have been very, very controlled and carefully layered. They have. And so the whole thing is structural in its own right. Even right. when it's not in flower, you've got this fabulous structural uh, sort of effect from the espaliered plant. Yeah. And do laburnums colour nicely in autumn? Not particularly. They go a soft yellow and drop their leaves. And that's right. why it's really important to train them well, mm. as these ones have been, because otherwise they're just going to be a mishmash for most of the year, mm. but spectacular for just that couple of weeks when they're in flower in the early spring. And I guess the other thing you could do is grow something through it, like a clematis. You something. could. You could do something like that. Some um, uh, clematis that you can prune down each winter mm. uh, could work quite well because they'll be only just underway when the laburnum's in flower. So you could, yes, you could multi layer if you wanted to have a crack at that. Excellent. Well, on to the next New Zealand magnificence. Why not indeed? Now, where is this next garden? I love these combinations. Well, we're at Clackenburn Station yes. uh, at Pukatoi, which yep. is in the Canterbury area of the South Island of New Zealand. Yes. And Jane Falconer was our host. Yep. And she has an amazing garden on a large farming property mm. uh, and well worthwhile having a look at. Beautiful garden. So what have we got going on here? Is well, that a Ligularia I yes. spot? Yes, that's Ligularia dentata desdemona. But hasn't, haven't they all changed their name? No, not all of them. Oh. The genus has been split up. Oh. And some things have moved out into Farfugium, and I'm sure there's oh. other things that have been moved out somewhere else. But anyhow, this is still a Ligularia. I'm zoning out, anyway, yeah, yes. And it has this wonderful purplish sheen to the leaves. It's not purple, purple, but you've got that sort of purple underside, and it goes really well with the shuttlecock fern. Which I love. Now, it so happens, I bought one from you last year, mm. Stephen Ryan, a shuttlecock fern. It's just been completely eaten by caterpillars. But my question, this, these shuttlecock ferns look like they're in full sun. Mm. Mine is in quite deep shade. What is the best conditions for that well, fern? They're actually, they do have a tree over canopy where ah, these ones are okay. growing at Clackenburn. Mm. So they're getting very high light levels, mm. but not much direct sunlight. Right. And of course the shuttlecock ferns sort of zing in amongst the purplish foliage of the Ligularia. Beautiful. And the whole thing's backed by that rather handsome old weeping Japanese maple, which yes. also pulls that purple color into play. And we have made a video about Japanese maples, which we'll link below. Yep. The other thing that this moment of this beautiful garden illustrates is your theory that bridges need to have a point, i.e. you can't, you mustn't be able to see the end of the body of water for a bridge to make sense visually. So well, this exactly. is a perfect bridge. If you can walk around it. Why would you go point? over the bridge? Yes, why would you have a bridge? <laughs> but I love this yeah. garden. Yeah, uh, yeah. Clackenburn was a fantastic place to be. The, the garden was superb um, and it was done basically by the, the woman herself. So there's been um, uh, not a lot of outside help mm. and certainly the design and layout is all her own work. Excellent. Well, let's go on to the next. So what's our last garden of copper and green combinations? Right. Well, this one is, has taken it to new levels. Yep. We're going to the Trotts Garden in Ashburton, which is not terribly far from Christchurch. Yep. And it's a nearly three hectare garden. And we're going to have a look at the red border at the Trotts Garden. Mm. So as you can see, a lot of red, Stephen. Now, yep. we've made a film about Miscanthus duluxii. You've got a thing for painting things red in your yeah. garden. Uh, could obviously, this, the trots have as well. Uh, could they have taken it a step too far? Well, I don't know. It's, it's it, well, all gardens are personal reflections and taste. Yeah. And so, obviously, they were happy with what they'd done. Yeah. Uh, for me, I think probably there's a little bit too much burgundy foliage. I have to say the red sculptural elements, obelisks and the uh, metal two-dimensional figures that are standing up in the garden actually zing quite well amongst yeah. that burgundy foliage. But I think, you know, it may have been just slightly overdone, but there's a huge range of plants in there. I mean, you've got the 
uh, berberuses in different shades of burgundy. You've got mm. the weeping Japanese maples in mm. burgundy. You've got all sorts of other bronze to purple things like the Persicaria red dragon. Yeah. And as you go along the border, there's even a dead maple that has been pruned back and then painted bright red. Now, I think, wasn't it Coco Chanel who said, you know, when you're leaving a room, you should look at yourself in the mirror quickly and take off one thing? Yeah. Do you think perhaps they could have taken out a bit of bronze? Because one of your points is when you're using coloured foliage, use it sparingly, yeah. otherwise you kind of don't see it. Yeah, well, and the other issue is, of course, with dark foliage is everything becomes quite gothic. Now, yeah. if that's in fact the image you're trying to create, well, it seems to have worked. And uh, as you often say too, if it's my garden, I love it. So yeah, exactly. who cares what you yes, think? Exactly. And the plant of absolute importance in this garden yeah. i think is at the end of it there's this amazing weeping copper beech, which is incredible because i thought it was the weeping sequoia that yeah. is behind us here which we've also made a video about but it's a weeping beech. i've yeah. never seen such a yeah. thing well it's not a commonly available tree certainly mm. in australia i'm not sure we've even got that particular cultivar mm. we do have a weeping copper beech, but it makes a little mound mm. uh, this one has a vertical leader mm. and weeping side branches Beautiful, beautiful tree. Fabulous thing. Well, well Stephen, our uh, New Zealand epic ends where it began in a different garden, but this time a hedge of that pitostorum. You said it was hard to propagate. It is it's hard to hedge propagate. Well, some people are lucky to have been able to source a batch of them at some stage or another. Oh. So yes, here we are in front of uh, Pitosporum Tom Thumb, uh, looking quite nice as an informal hedge. How fantastic. Well, what an amazing trip you had without me to those incredible gardens in New Zealand. Yes. Thank you to all the garden owners. Yes, and thank you to ASA for paying me to go there. So Absolutely. There you so if you are interested in going on any of the journeys that uh, Stephen does, where else do you go? You go to amazing places. Well, next year we're off to Spain, Northwest France, the year after Madeira and the Azores. Oh. Probably back to Madagascar again in a couple of years time. Oh. So yes, you name it, I go there. And these are all garden tours and anyone around the world can buy into them. Yes, you don't have to be an Australian to join Australian Studying Abroad. There you go. So we'll put all the links below. Many, many thanks to all the garden owners. All the plant lists are below as well. There's many plants that we've covered. Mm -hmm. So thank you, incidentally, to Dale, who happens to have this hedge yes. of New Zealand Petostrum, which is beautiful. And how could we possibly top an epic tour of New Zealand's South Island Gardens? Probably by me going to Spain, France, Madeira, Madeira. Madeira. Yeah, oh. or, or Madagascar. All right, well, we'll, we'll hopefully be able to join those trips when you do them next year. But if you want to know what we're doing next week, hit subscribe. We post every Friday and we look forward to seeing you next week. And we also do shorts. So do. send me a question and I'll see if I can answer it in 60 seconds. <laughs> see you next week. Bye all.